Hello, my dear friends. Today, uh, I'm welcoming you back to my virtual classroom. And um, the topic for our lecture this Tuesday is Soviet communism. Again, remember, I like to build links between what we did uh, last time and what we are going to do. So let me uh, draw your attention to what we did last time. And uh, we talked about First World War. Okay. I would like to show you something. Okay. Last time in my um, presentation, I showed you this poster. Remember? And I even made a comment about five minutes. I... <clears throat> uh, indulge myself into speculations about this particular poster basically telling you that um, that this particular poster poster that was um, uh, printed in UK during the First World War was like a, a symbol like a metaphor of what was going on uh, or what happened with people as a result of this war so you see here people marching soldiers in front, civilian people, clerks, judges, workers, some farmers, even some kind of vagrants with the sex. So basically you see entire society stepping into a particular place, marching, being lined in a particular line. And that's how people got used to leave in the wake of the First World War when martial methods, which were normal, uh, under extreme emergency circumstances during the First World War became the new normal in the wake of the war. Remember last class I showed you at the very end the picture of the big dictators or strong men who presided over their own countries during the so-called interwar period, that's the 1920s, 1930s. You see their... Um, Joseph Pilsudski, you see Vladimir Lenin, Stalin, FDR, United States, you could see Churchill, um, a bunch of others. You, basically, the uh, message I wanted to convey to you that that was the time of dictators, the time when people were marching like these people you can see um, uh, on this poster. Uh, individual person was nothing, okay? Everything was... Um, revolving around the group, a collective. People were mobilized. People were collectivized. Okay? Economies, all economies were nationalized. There was no room. There was hardly any room for a private initiative. A constitution, a democracy, elections, okay? court system. All these um, uh, ways of so-called Western civilization were... Uh, I wouldn't say terminated, but uh, lost popularity in the eyes of the people. And in fact, um, in some countries, these things did lose popularity because um, in 1920s, 1930s, we see a bunch of countries uh, all over the world uh, becoming dictatorships. If you look at the map of Europe, you will see that except maybe Switzerland or UK, France, um, Sweden, all other countries were dictatorships more ruthless or less ruthless so uh the world the world was becoming uh, dictatorial uh, tyrants were becoming more popular okay deportation of populations concentration camps mobilization of economy remember we talked about war socialism in germany Okay, war industry board in u.s Ration, rationing of food very important rationing of food so not money but um, ration coupons became important. So civilian population and people from colonies were mobilized. Okay, And today we're going to discuss the first dictatorship, the first and foremost dictatorship that affected the um, development of the world. It is Soviet communism. Soviet communism, the first dictatorship. Okay. <clears throat> So, uh, what I'm trying to say that the methods tried during World War I uh, by many millions of people were thought to be valid for a peaceful time. So, they got used to being mobilized and they uh, decided to do it in the wake of the war. They said, hey, it's good. Okay, we were mobilized during this war 
And now we can mobilize ourselves yeah, to rebuild the economy or just to have regular life. We don't need money. We can ration food. We have a, we need a big, strong man, man in front, on top of us who will give us orders, who will issue decrees, okay? And uh, he will treat us uh, fairly as children, his children, okay? So the uh, violence became normalized, became the new normal idea that uh, life in trenches of World War I was the authentic life, tough life, you know, this kind of cultivation of manhood or martial methods, okay? People were searching for enemies to be blamed, okay? It, it was a very popular at that time. <clears throat> uh, overall, governmental control over and regulation of economy and society increased, dramatically increased, because, I repeat, of the emergency situation, the war. I want to emphasize again any emergency situation, a situation of war, uh, an epidemic. I'm not going to uh, into details, you know, <laughs> something about epidemics. Any emergency situation increases the power of this big uh, government that controls our life. And uh, when uh, an emergency situation is gone, uh, uh, many governments are tempted to continue like it was before. Okay. So there were attacks on free market, disillusionment in the parliamentary system. A lot of people were upset about democracy, about progress, constitutionalism. They expected that a strong hand, a strong man uh, would uh, save people from poverty, provide them with social welfare, so everything would be good. So that was the mindset, mindset of the people in the wake of the war. Okay, And in, in a few countries, this type of... Um, mindset which i just described manifested itself in a very extreme form in a very extreme form okay when um, in a few countries such as germany italy or russia former russian empire this type of sentiments that everything should be controlled by the government uh, everything should be regulated by the government became um, reached extremes, extremes, and this type of extreme governmental control we call a totalitarianism. So please remember this word. I'm going to introduce this new word for you, uh, totalitarianism. So we are talking about totalitarian government. It means a total control of a public life, okay, uh, to the point that government decided to interfere into private lives of the people to tell them what to do and when to wake up, what to think, what books to read. Um, and again, the Soviet Russia, Soviet communism, which we are going to discuss today, is the best example of this type of attitude. Okay, So the totalitarian government was the product of World War I. Okay? Uh, one of the major features of this type of government, totalitarian government, was a loyalty to uh, the leader, a strong man, okay the faith that private life should be controlled by a government okay one party uh one newspaper okay one man on top and that would be it. no freedom of speech freedom of, there was no room for freedom of speech okay so there was no point to talk about it because totalitarian government by default implied that there would be no freedom of press no freedom of speech so a group collective was everything and an individual was nothing. That was the message of this type of government. Okay. Uh, look at the map of uh, Europe. Okay. Look at the map of Europe. And you will see that um, what is colored in uh, beige. These beige, these countries that are colored in beige, beige, these are the countries which had dictatorships. All right. So, it means uh, most of the European countries, they did become dictatorships, okay? Except what I mentioned, uh, Great Britain, Sweden, Finland, I forgot to mention Finland, Switzerland, okay? And plus these countries, Austria, Czechoslovakia, France, they were later occupied by Germany and also became dictatorships. So, by 19, um, 1940, 1940, we have only three countries. Norway was also occupied by Germany, not the Germany. So we essentially, by the end of this interwar period, on the eve of the Second World War, we have only three countries in Europe. 
which rem had some kind of constitutional government remaining. It's Great Britain, Sweden, Finland. All the rest were dictatorships, okay? <clears throat> but even Western democracies that did maintain constitutions and some rights of the people, US, Britain, France, they could not avoid this general trend, what I just described to you. Of course, they didn't have any totalitarianism, but they did make steps toward the big government. Okay, In, uh, in these countries, which were democracies, well, Britain was a constitutional monarchy, US was a republic, France was a republic, but I mean, they had democratic elections. Okay, So even in these countries, uh, popular mood or popular uh, sentiments were shifting toward this kind of love for the big government. And uh, the best example in US when there was so much love for FDR, who was treated as the savior of the nation and who was elected four times, four times was elected, a unique example in US history, four times elected as a, a president of the United States, okay? So we will be talking more in the next week about the New Deal, okay? So both on the left and on the right, um, many people insisted that government should restrain predatory businesses, should take care of common people, this type of sentiments, okay? Here, I decided to show you something that might help you visually to comprehend what was going on at that time in the world, at least in Europe and North America, but other countries as by default, because Latin America, same thing, okay, dictatorships. Africa was a literal colony of European countries, okay. So whatever I show you, show to you here, is in fact characteristic for the whole world. So uh, what we are talking here is um, this phenomenon of the big government going global, okay? And um, in two countries, this type of uh, phenomenon going uh, government, big government going global, received uh, its extreme uh, became expressed in extreme forms. Okay, we we are talking about communism, Soviet Union, see color then red. That's red color of communism and Nazi Germany, National Socialism, by the way. So many, uh, socialists, many socialists don't like to uh, transcribe this word in uh, National Socialism. They prefer to talk about Nazi because when you talk about Nazi, you can hide the word socialism, okay? So they don't like the word socialism uh, uh, be associated with uh, Nazi Germany. So they're kind of hiding it, <laughs> although uh, formally uh, Nazi Germany did preach National Socialism. They talk about National Socialism, Socialism for the nation, for the German nation. We will be also talking about this, okay, um, either this Thursday uh, or next week. See, totalitarianism in extreme forms. There was also um, harsh totalitarianism in fascist Italy, but compared to Nazi Germany and communist Russia, fascism in Italy was just a joke. It was a very benign. It was not as cruel as uh, totalitarianism in, uh, under Soviets and uh, in Nazi Germany. And finally, uh, we have this mild, benign forms of governmental regulations. Is a new deal, uh, like New Deal in the United States. And as I said, uh, next week, we are going to have um, a special lecture on... Uh, the New Deal in the United States. So it's a served version of a big government or governmental control, uh, simply because in uh, US, England, and France, there were many roadblocks on the way to totalitarianism. There was a powerful tradition of constitutionalism, which um, put roadblocks on the way to such kind of people like FDR who wanted to grab a lot of power. Okay. So please keep it in mind, this chart, it might help you to understand what was going on at that time in the world. Okay, first, first is our conversation, uh, is going to be our conversation on Soviet totalitarianism or Soviet communism. Okay, so far we didn't talk uh, too much about Russia. We did mention uh, Russia in the context of World War I. We said the last time, remember, that Russia was fighting, was part of so-called uh, a group of countries called allies. It's uh, uh, France, uh, England, and Russia, three countries, against 
Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Ottoman Empire. Okay, and remember, I mentioned that uh, in 1917, Russia, that was a semi backward country, so Russia was still in the process of industrialization and she was not able to fully industrialize herself. So that is why her military, her industry were weak, were still weak. Okay, and uh, Russia, which was uh, an empire headed by a czar, okay, she didn't have enough resources to stay in the war in the war for a long time. She mobilized 15 million peasants, Russian peasants, sent them to the front lines to fight against Germans, but they didn't have enough rifles, cartridges, didn't have enough guns. Okay, a soon. Uh, weak Russian agriculture was depleted by this draft, uh, uh, draft of so many millions, so millions of peasants. So weak Russian agriculture uh, didn't have enough resources to uh, provide food supplies, food shipments to stores, to the front lines, because Russian agriculture was still a very primitive. They didn't have machines, didn't have tractors. So um, Russia, the Russian Empire was a huge very big the biggest country in the world but very weak yet in terms of industry remember she had been beaten by japan in the local russo-japanese war in 1904 remember we talked about these small wars all over the world among different groups of imperialist countries over colonies so russia was fighting with japan um, over northeastern china and japan this tiny country uh, which had been able to industrialize herself very quickly. She was able to defeat Ru the Russian Empire. Okay, so Russia was weak, and this weak empire, Russian Empire, got involved in the World War One, and of course, uh, she could not stay there for a long. So by 1917, it was clear that Germany, which was more powerful, the, which was uh, a number. Um, a two industrial power by the end of the 19th century Germany after the United States and UK she became number two power in the world in terms of industry military so Germany was beating Russians and uh, Russia wasn't able to sustain itself to keep herself in the war and that's when Russia started to collapse and I mentioned last time that at some point uh, a bread riot started in the capital of the Russian Empire, St. Petersburg, bread riots, okay, women whose husbands were at the front lines, they went to demonstrate, um, demanding bread, okay, because there were bread lines, or many stores were closed, there was not enough bread, and the soldiers sent against these women, ladies, refused to disperse them, instead, soldiers sent against these women who demonstrated in St. Petersburg, they joined these women, so and as soon the Russian Tsar Nicholas II was toppled down and instead of the Tsar, Russia, which collapsed, received so-called uh, pr provisional government that put itself in charge of Russia, trying to uh, quickly rebuild Russia, somehow to give Russia a new government. So they called, this new government called itself a provisional government. Okay, that's where, what I mentioned last time. So today we will talk more about it. Okay, so Russian Empire was the biggest country in the world in terms of land mass, but as I said, in terms of industry, it was still a backward country, or semi backward, because there was some industry in uh, St. Petersburg and Moscow, okay, but uh, other areas were backward, okay. Russia did have factories, but they were a few, a few. Only in the big city, in big cities. Eighty percent of people were peasants, ignorant peasants, uneducated, primitive agriculture. They used wooden plows, no tractors. B very backward economy. Uh, I didn't mention it. The um, Russian peasantry was enslaved, literally. They were serfs until 1861. 1861. It was only in 1861 when peasants were liberated. Before they were serfs. You know what uh, uh, what uh, uh, status of a serf means. Remember, we talked about in the beginning of this course about um, medieval Europe and how peasants at first in Europe were serfs, and then they 
became free. Okay, so Russia uh, had an emperor, no democracy, no parliament, no political parties. Okay, so when Russia collapsed as a result of this war, when um, supply lines were disrupted, when Russia didn't have food to feed her population, okay. So this triggered so-called March Revolution. March Revolution when the Tsar Nicholas II was toppled down and instead we have provisional government. Government? Provisional government um, come into power. Again, the name of this government was provisional, it, provisional which means um, uh, this government treated itself as a temporary government. Uh, the goal was to prepare Russia for uh, new elections. Okay nationwide elections uh, it was expected that um, people who populated the Russian uh, the former Russian Empire they would elect a new parliament free elections all political parties were legalized freedom of speech freedom of press okay which was good of course although peasants didn't understand too much about these elections they didn't know what elections were okay they didn't care about the freedom of press because, I repeat, the majority of the population were uneducated, very uneducated. Um, the biggest mistake provisional government uh, made when uh, it pledged to continue war with Germany, which made people upset because these ignorant peasants, they didn't know what this war was all about. It was like a, a stupid war, and they were right in this case because... The war disrupted their uh, traditional lifestyle. Okay, they they didn't care about what uh, that war, World War One, was fought about. Okay, that Russian Tsar wanted to help Serbia against Germany, Austria-Hungary. Okay, so when Russia was disrupted, uh, Tsar stepped down. The country plunged into anarchy and chaos. So Russia quits the war. And by the way, that's when the United States stepped in, 1917. Remember, we mentioned that the United States was asked by UK and France to step in and to save the situation because when Russia quit the war, it um, upset UK and France because now it was UK and France against Germany, Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire. So there was a fear on the part of the English and the French that they might lose this war. So that is why they begged they begged the United States, please step in. And finally, the U.S. stepped in, sent in 1917 one million troops. And of course, there was no way for Germany or for Austria-Hungary or for Ottoman Empire to resist. There was, there was so much hardware. There was so, so much manpower that soon Germany um, started begging for peace. Okay, remember, Germany was not defeated in 1918, but Germany, being overwhelmed by this military force sent by the United States, begged uh, UK, France, and US, please let's sign the armistice, okay, armistice agreement to uh, terminate military activities. And this agreement was signed, and then Germany, remember we last time talked about it, Germany was imposed an uneven, unequal treaty. Okay, at first, uh, that American president, uh, remember who um, president, the president was at that time in the U.S.? It was Woodrow Wilson, a Democrat, who said the World War I was fought uh, for democracy, and he said there would be no winners and losers in this war because everybody was responsible, so Germany uh, was not to be blamed. But the opposite happened. Germany was blamed. So UK and France made sure that Germany was blamed. Germany was imposed, forced to sign a peace treaty, which humiliated Germany very much. Okay, Germany was forced to pay a 20, um, 23, I think, or 28. Look at the PowerPoints uh, for last time. I think, yeah, uh, 28 uh, uh, billion dollars of redemption. Okay, money to UK and France. Plus, Germany was forbidden to have an army and on top of this Germany lost uh, chunks of land both in the east and the west so Germany was humiliated which as I said later uh, opened the doors to people like Hitler okay so what happened in the west okay for a while distracted the attention of uh, the western countries but in the meantime in the east 
something was going on that also later affected the fate of the world okay when us um, uh, uk and france and germany and austrians were involved at in, uh, first in fighting and then in uh, signing this peace treaty um, in russia in 1917 there were people called bolsheviks okay who said that uh, they wanted to build socialism in russia they mobilized themselves as a powerful force 100,000 members and sympathizers and decided to take over power the situation was very ripe for this because there was anarchy there was a vacuum of power but these people called bolsheviks again in translation from russian as you see here it's called people of majority so these were the russian communists okay who wanted to come to power okay their goal was to build communism to make sure that the prophecy of communism that had been promoted by karl marx remember we talked about communism in the wake of the industrial revolution we have this prophecy of communism a radical version of socialism okay being popular so the, these were the people bolsheviks who shared this prophecy who wanted to fulfill this prophecy in the russian empire okay so they believed that through a violent through a violent revolution of so-called proletariat industrial workers they would be able to bring paradise on the earth that was the goal to build communism okay some called it socialism other called it communism but they use these two words as synonyms okay although i repeat in our uh, present day usage we usually uh, when we call when we say communism it, we, it means that a militant or radical version of socialism when we talk about socialism it's either an umbrella expression for uh, both communism and socialism or on many occasions today people use it the word socialism when they want to describe the soft version okay of governmental control a soft version socialism militant version is communism okay um bolsheviks customized uh, karl marx prophecy to the russian conditions to the russian realities okay what they did they expanded this argument of karl marx that uh we need uh, oh, communists need um, a clandestine political party that would lead these uh, noble savages industrial workers uh into the revolution okay so lenin who was uh, the chief of the russian bolsheviks this man okay i remember the name of vladimir lenin he was the leader of the bolsheviks okay he lived as an immigrant in switzerland okay waiting for the moment when to come to russia he was a charismatic person okay uh, so he argued that we need um, a very disciplined political communist party that would be put in charge of workers and bring them to power in russia in other countries too and soon he believed uh, that uh, the russian revolution was going to become a stepping stone for the world communist revolution okay the slogan remember the slogan that um, karl marx and frederick engels came up with the slogan actually it's a phrase that ends their small book called the communist manifesto so if you look at the communist manifesto at the very end of this book it says workers of all countries unite so bolsheviks took all, took this slogan okay literally and said that what we are going to do in russia is going to be a spark that would ignite this worldwide holocaust revolutionary holocaust that would destroy old society and will build a new society okay workers peasants and people of colonies should revolt together against uh, colonialism and they would build paradise on the earth that was the message okay <clears throat> Um, as I said, Lenin and his Bolsheviks they, Bolsheviks, they customized the message of Marxism to the Russian conditions. Okay? Uh, Marx, Engels argued that 
no country would be able to have a communist revolution before the majority of population would become industrial workers. So um, a country aspiring to become communist at first should be an advanced country, should be fully industrialized. But the Bolsheviks changed this. They said, um, oh, it's um, not exactly right. You know, it's right, but in the contemporary age, it changed because we do have a capitalism, industrial society uh, coming to the picture in such highly advanced countries like UK, France, Germany, the United States. But unfortunately, in Russia, we still have peasants. Okay, so it's not a full industrialized country. Okay, so what we need to do in Russia, uh, we need to make a communist revolution by establishing a union between peasants and workers. So that's how they resolve this problem. So we don't need uh, to wait when uh, entire when an enti the entire country would become full industrialized, and of course, when the country would be full industrialized it uh, would have uh, industrial workers the majority of population and that's when we're going to have a communist revolution that's what classical marxist doctrine said but bolsheviks changed it they said yes it's correct in theory but in life it's more complicated than look worldwide we have already capitalism or industrial society been victorious in the most advanced countries but in such peripheral peripheral areas like the russian empire that's semi-backward we can make a union between people of the old peasants and people of the new society workers they would make a union against the rich people and together they will kick out capitalists and landlords okay and since russia was so devastated by the war this prophecy of bolsheviks that was interpreted in a very simple way that the poor people who didn't have enough to eat okay and peasants didn't have enough land they needed to revolt against the rich and kill them okay so very simple interpretation so that is why bolsheviks became very popular so they were uh, very talented uh, propaganda workers so bolsheviks infested the russian army uh sent uh to the Russian army agitators who were arguing against the war and they were popular okay because peasants and people in general started hating this war okay so that's how Bolsheviks by the way became popular because they um, were speaking against the war that was their biggest coup and of course a lot of people hated this war and they rightly so so Bolsheviks were talented um, propaganda workers they came up with this simple slogan another slogan see the one the first one they took from communist manifesto workers of all countries unite and then they came up with their own slogan that said peace land bread peace it means end the war land it means give land to the peasants so bolsheviks said that a landlord's land should be confiscated and given to the peasants great so that is why peasants supported them bread it means uh, people should have enough to eat very popular slogans okay so Lenin who as I said uh, lived prior to 1917 in uh, Switzerland when he noticed that um, the Russian Tsar stepped down and when new weak government provisional government came into power with no teeth at all uh, the government provisional government was speaking about democracy constitution which was alien to the majority of the people unfortunately so he realized that that was his moment so he felt that that was his moment his time to come and he wanted desperately to go to russia but he couldn't why because europe was still divided by the war the war was fought on and that's when um, he reached a secret agreement with the German military staff. Okay, so each side play played each other. Okay, German military command wanted to disable Russia to drive Russia from the war in order to have free hands in the Western Front. Okay, when the United States were coming, in order to do this, they decided to give a green light to Lenin and his Bolsheviks to do what? To move to Russia to allow them to. Uh, 
make a journey from Switzerland uh, to Russia uh, through German territory. Okay, the German military command ordered uh, the German military not to touch the Bolsheviks, so they were put in a special sealed train. Okay, Bolsheviks and the Bolsheviks, of course had their own agenda, they wanted to quickly come to Russia to make a revolution, so both sides took advantage of each other. The reason I'm saying this is because to the present day there is a bunch of conspiracy theories out there, if you go to YouTube, that uh, say that Lenin was a German spy, so Bolsheviks were sent by Germans to uh, topple down the Russian government in order um, to defeat the Russian Empire, it's, it's not right, it's not correct. Lenin was not a spy, he simply, um, he was an unscrupulous, uh, unscrupulous, uh, unscrupulous revolutionary who decided to use Germans to his own benefit, and Germans used Lenin to their own benefit, okay? So Germans, in fact, Germans even secretly gave money to the Bolsheviks, so Bolsheviks used thousands of Deutsche, uh, German marks, to sponsor this revolution, okay. Um, in 1917, when army was collapsing, Lenin came to Russia just at the right time, okay. Soldiers didn't want to fight, and Lenin said, stop fighting, turn your bayonets uh, against uh, rich, the rich people. He said, don't throw the guns away, but keep them and turn them against the rich people. In fact, he argued that German, American, English workers should join Russian workers and together they should fight against the rich people. So that was the major message of Bolsheviks. Okay. And uh, it was easy for the Bolsheviks to pick up the power. Okay. Lenin, in fact, he didn't need to take power. He only picked up the power. Picked up the power. 1917, in the fall, to be specific, October 1917, Bolsheviks suddenly mobilized their Red Guards in St. Petersburg, the capital of Russia, ordered to uh, Red Guards to occupy train stations, all major train stations, telegraph, all postal stations, okay, all banks, and that was it. The provisional government was kicked out. Nobody wanted to defend this provisional government, okay, and the Bolsheviks quickly uh, took over the country, okay. They declared that all land should be seized by peasants, which made peasants happy, of course. But Lenin established a dictatorship. He said that we are the only ones who know how to bring this paradise on the earth. We are the only political party who knows how to build the future, okay. So they made all other political parties illegal. They immediately cracked down on the freedom of speech, and that was bad. So Bolsheviks, or Russian communists, established a communist dictatorship in the former Russian Empire. <clears throat> immediately, Bolsheviks uh, concluded the peace treaty with Germany. They didn't want to fight. It was part of this agreement that after Lenin uh, took over power in Russia, he would make an agreement with Germans, okay, and he did this, he did conclude a peace treaty with Germans, and in fact gave Germans uh, the entire European part of Russia, which made um, some people in Russia upset, but uh, the Bolsheviks, uh, many Bolsheviks were happy because they said, um, by doing this, uh, we actually uh, pacify our enemy because Russian army is uh, ineffective anyway by doing this we are going to save our communist revolution for future victories okay but uh, many people uh, some people not many it's not correct some people in russia were upset about the bolsheviks bolshevik bolshevik takeover and especially about uh, bolsheviks making peace with germans okay and uh, these people became known as whites, supporters of the old regime. Although uh, it's a very superficial expression, whites. That is why I put it in quotation marks. Um, at first, the word white was used to label those people who supported the old Tsarist regime, imperial regime. But soon, um, among the whites, we find those people who disagreed with Bolsheviks, okay, those who defended constitutional government, okay, or even some moderate socialists who joined uh, 
this anti-Bolshevik force because they didn't like the Bolshevik dictatorship. Anyway, but all these people together, they were called whites. Okay. Why, in the first place, this expression was introduced is because the chevrons and the flag and the color of the old regime before 1917 was white. White color was the symbol of purity. So soldiers had white chevrons and the um, um, Russian flag had the white stripe. Okay, So that is why a label was app applied to these people who were fighting against the Bolsheviks, whites. Bolsheviks called themselves reds. Why? Because they were communists and their color was red. They had red flags, uh, a red uh, hammer and sickle, a red star. Okay. Um, reds were better organized. Okay. Whites, as I said, they were not united bunch. They had no coordination. In fact, they were fighting against each other because, excuse me, as I said, whites, it was a loose group of forces who even did not communicate with each other because among the whites we might find, we could find some moderate socialists and uh, monarchists and republican uh, people who defended the republic, uh, republic, constitutionalists, uh, constitutional monarchists, so any kind of folks. But the Reds were better organized and that is why they became more successful. Okay, more successful. Plus foreign intervention into Russian affairs. Some uh, allied, allied commanders were afraid that soon supplies they sent to Russia could be seized by the Germans. That is why they sent small expeditionary forces in um, Crimea, in northern Russia, or in the Far East. Americans sent an expeditionary force, uh, France uh, and English sent troops to the Crimea, and England sent also troops to northern Russia to safeguard uh, military storages, okay, people, uh, uh, stores that had uh, military supplies. But it, uh, on some occasions, whites um, used these guns, these rifles from these military stores to give them to the whites, okay? And that worked uh, to benefit the Reds because Reds took advantage of the situation. They said, hey, we are the ones who defend Russia against foreign invaders, okay? So they could milk this uh, patriotic sentiment. So that's how our original map looked when uh, Bolsheviks took over control of the small area and then whites were all over. But eventually Bolsheviks were winning, winning. Because this man, the right-hand man, a chief lieutenant of uh, Lenin named Leon Trotsky, a Russian Jewish intellectual, he was he organized the Red Army. Red Army. It's uh, the army of the Bolsheviks. Okay, the Red Army, which was able to defeat the whites, a tightly organized, disciplined army. Okay. <clears throat> In fact, uh, the Bolsheviks, they had uh, this uh, new anthem for their regime. No, it doesn't. It, I can't play it right now. So they um, uh, introduced a new anthem for their regime. I, I want to draw your attention to the, line, to the first line from this anthem, which actually uh, is the best description of the essence of this early regime. It starts with this phrase, rise up rise up the wretched of the earth so this um, anthem was addressed not to uh, specifically people of the former russian empire it was addressed to the entire globe okay because the bolsheviks expectation was that communism would would soon prevail all over the world and in russia they would they made a revolution they took over power and as soon they would go beyond the russian borders and they sweep away all the capitalists, all rich pigs, away from the globe. So here you can see a cartoon, a poster issued by the Bolsheviks in Russia, where this Lenin, this guy, the, the top Bolshevik, he is shown sweeping away the globe, sweeping away these rich pigs. Okay, that was the message. <clears throat> to... Uh, to destroy, to phase out the enemies, Bolsheviks immediately 
introduced Red Terror, replicating what, by the way, Jacobins had done during the French Revolution. In fact, the Reds or Bolsheviks, they um, loved Jacobins. They loved to learn from the French Revolution. They were fascinated with this uh, Jacobin terror. Remember when guillotine was used against the enemies of the revolution. Okay, so if you forgot who Jacobins were, so please refresh your knowledge of the French Revolution. Okay, so French Revolution had the terror against the royal, uh, royalists, against the priests, and Bolsheviks decided to replicate this experience, not only to replicate, but they amplified this experience, they expanded this experience. Okay, so they said, Bolsheviks, that we need to phase out the alien classes of people. Okay, first, who were the alien classes? Alien classes were landlords, then um, manufacturers, bankers, merchants, clergy, people of religion. They should be phased out. In fact, they started to set up concentration camps to lock these alien elements. Okay, so Bolsheviks uh, adopted this practice of concentration camps. Remember, this practice had been introduced by the Brits. In South Africa so now Bolsheviks learned from this practice and uh, they locked their their uh, class enemies locked in concentration camps okay in fact they believe that some alien classes they it's better to phase out completely alien classes that um, in the world of the future they should take only friendly classes like workers and um, peasants although they can did not consider peasants a fully developed class you know they only trusted industrial workers remember the message of marxism original message of marxism was that it was only industrial workers who were the salt of the earth they were going to save the world from oppression industrial workers were treated as uh, what chosen people who were uh, who came to this world by natural laws to save the world from oppression but peasants were so throwbacks from the old society they were okay but not exactly good ones so industrial workers should be in charge of the peasants and use peasants as allies okay so uh, they used the red terror bolsheviks against alien classes or simply against people who s were speaking against them okay in order to uh, keep people to intimidate people into submission they created so-called cheka it was the name for the secret police. Cheka, it's an abbreviation. Uh, it's a long name called Extraordinary Commission to Combat Sabotage and Counter-Revolution. So it's a long name. The abbreviation from this long expression would be Cheka. Essentially, it became a secret police that penalized uh, shoot by shooting and arresting people for, uh, for sabotage or counter-revolution. Sabotage, it's uh, like... A, a, uh, bands of sailors or some soldiers, marauding bands of sailors, soldiers who were raiding stores, red stores or wineries, so Bolsheviks uh, were shooting at them, and plus also shooting um, uh, rich people, okay, manufacturers, aristocrats, or some middle class people who were speaking against them, so a lot of people were executed, thousands of people. Okay, But the goal of Bolsheviks was to eliminate private property and money, Okay, all together, what they were doing from 1918 to 1920 became known as the war communism. Okay, so it's like a martial society where money was abolished. They abolished money. They uh, abolished trade. They put all fact. They nationalized all factories. They put them under governmental control. Okay, and uh, they also started to confiscate grain from peasants. I remember at first peasants were very happy that they received land, they enjoyed themselves, okay, we confiscated the land of landlords, now land is ours. But uh, no sooner had they give land to the peasants, then Bolsheviks started to confiscate peasant grains. Why? To feed the Red Army, to feed their secret police, okay. Plus Bolsheviks declared private property the enemy, so they said that our goal was to squash private property and it was uh, to be it was the fulfillment of the basic message of marxism remember karl marx and, and friedrich engels the founders founding fathers of communism um, communism marx and communism they argued that 
private property should be eliminated okay <clears throat> so what happened as a result of communism uh, war communism uh, soon the entire industry was shut down because people stopped working uh, nobody paid any salaries okay so workers uh, uh, workers stopped going to factories to work because there were no incentives people don't work for free okay um, peasants uh, whose grain was confiscated said why do we need to work on the land when all our grains were confiscated okay and as soon the, since the, the food was not produced 1.5 million people died there were even incidents of cannibalism cannibalism in russia <clears throat> And quickly peasants realized three years later that Bolsheviks were not friends, were not their friends. Finally, they saw what Bolsheviks wanted. Okay, they didn't expect that Bolsheviks would crack down and confiscate their grain, but that's exactly what happened. So peasants started to revolt, and the first mass revolt of peasants against the Bolsheviks was so-called Tambov Revolt in Central Russia, 1921, and soon sailors who were former peasants who received letters from those peasants those few peasants who could write they sent letters to sailors and said how desperate their situation was in the countryside so sailors in Kronstadt Kronstadt it was a fortress the fortress uh, not far from St. Petersburg the capital of Russia former capital of Russia <clears throat> and uh, sailors stationed in this uh, fortress revolted against Bolsheviks okay and as soon um, almost the entire country was um, fighting against Bolsheviks so at some point Bolsheviks were afraid uh, were uh, fearing that they might lose the power so that uh, that's when they decided to back off back off they backed off they said, hey, we need to make a compromise. With whom? With these peasants. So that's when they did compromise. In 1921, they introduced so-called NEP. NEP, it's an abbreviation for New Economic Policy. So finally they said, okay, we are not going to confiscate your property. So what we are going to do, we will allow you to work freely on your land, on your plots, on your family plots. Um, just pay us a tax, a fixed tax, and then you are free to do whatever you want. You are free to sell your grain at the private market, whatever you want to do. In cities, they allow the limited private enterprise, okay, like uh, dineries, restaurants, or some um, uh, workshops were allowed to be owned by private people. Because originally Bolsheviks were against any private property, so everything should be controlled, the entire economy should be controlled by the government. That was the message of war communism. Now they realized it does not work. It does not work. It kills initiative. Okay. So in order to somehow compromise, they allowed peasants to work on their family plots and uh, in uh, in cities, they allowed like small workshops and restaurant business businesses to be owned by private people. Okay, mm -hmm. but at the same time, look at the uh, last bullet point. Economic and political control was in the hands of communists. So, uh, when they made a compromise, this compromise with mostly peasants, it was a calculated compromise. First. I want to say that Lenin had to defy his own comrades because a lot of Bolsheviks were against this compromise. But Lenin was a good politician. He was thinking in long-term perspectives. He said, uh, we have to temporarily compromise before we were cracking down on these peasants again. So he said, it's just a temporary compromise to feed the country and then we would crack down. Okay, that was the message. That's how he was able to convince the majority of his con uh, majority of his comrades to accept his NEP plan, because ideologically Bolsheviks were against this, because it was this compromise with private enterprise was against their ideology. Okay, remember, it's almost all over the world there were 
at that time there was hatred of private property or the private property was to be regulated that's what they believed at that time so that is why just to be to play it safe Bolsheviks decided to uh, keep uh, their major control in the hands of communists so they did not eliminate of course totalitarian control of the communist party of uh, the country secret police was still there so that is why the Russia was still a dictatorship but dictatorship with a limited private uh, enterprise okay that's what it was soon Lenin dies 1924 Lenin dies and he did not leave any successor okay uh, which uh, left two competitors who started fighting for power first I mentioned his name it's Trotsky Trotsky Leon Trotsky a popular civil war hero and the second one I did not mention yet but you may have heard about it, him it's Joseph Stalin who later became uh, uh, one of the most famous dictators Joseph Stalin at first was not a known guy he was an obscure guy he was operating in shadows his position was a general secretary he was like a paperwork guy he was in charge of paperwork personnel imagine um, a communist party human resources so that's what he was in charge of uh, quote unquote quote unquote uh, Bolshevik human resources he, he was in charge of files hiring people organizing some meetings okay because are the Bolsheviks Lenin Trotsky they didn't want to do it they thought about themselves as great statesmen speak theoreticians so Stalin uh, but Stalin didn't care he said oh I'm going to do this um, uh, dirty job your know, paperwork okay and that's how he wiggled himself into the power outsmarted everybody because you know that uh, that um, in any um, uh, in many companies corporations uh, it's the secretaries who control life not the CEOs because secretaries know everything so the Stalin uh, Bolshevik party <laughs> this CEO of Marxism was not an exception Stalin who was uh, who was the secretary general secretary in charge of this um, internal life of communist party he was the one who knew the ways and how to place his own people here and there and that's how he outsmarted his competitors okay so soon Stalin uh, was able to squeeze Trotsky out of power Trotsky lost his position as the uh, secretary of war he was not in charge anymore of the Red Army and as soon Trotsky was kicked out from the country in 1929 he was exiled from the Soviet Union eventually he escaped to Mexico because Trotsky hated him and eventually Stalin had Trotsky killed in Mexico City in 1940 there is a bunch of movies there if you're interested it's a very uh, how to say it's like a, a romantic horror story how Stalin's secret police was chasing Trotsky all over the world and eventually uh, had him killed by an ice pick <laughs> I'm not kidding I speak in 1940 Trotsky was killed <clears throat> by the way if you watch on Netflix there's a movie called Trotsky watch it what watch it and it shows you how this assassination was planned pl uh, planted and planned <laughs> so anyway Stalin succeeded and by uh, uh, 1927 he was in the full control and 19 by 1929 he already made so-called uh, second revolution Stalin revolution he was the dictator everybody was obedient to him and nobody was able to question his decisions so he was the man to control the situation uh, but Russia was still a backward country remember we said that Russia was a backward country the goal of Stalin was to industrialize Russia he had to deal with these peasants who were allowed by Lenin to work on their private plots for a while okay so now he felt that his uh, time came and he decided to crack down on peasants and 
confiscate the lands and again confiscate their not only lands but confiscate the grains to force them to work for the government okay but his um, his uh, ultimate goal was to squeeze grain from the peasants in order to sell this grain to western countries in order to get money to what to fund industrialization in russia because russia was a backward country in order to build a powerful industry in russia stalin needed to what uh, to do industrial revolution how western countries didn't want to fund his regime so he decided to sacrifice peasants to squeeze all the juices from peasants and particularly to round them up to force them to force them to uh, fulfill quotas grain quotas and he wanted to sell the uh, this grain to western countries to get money to fund the industrial revolution okay so that is why he sends arm in the secret police to the countryside rounding up peasants again here you can see that uh, a bolshevik sent by stalin uh, signing up peasants for collective farms so essentially all peasants were ordered to live on collective farms and they were not allowed they were not allowed to uh, leave these collective farms they became state serfs they were oblig they were obligated to work for the government they were given grain quotas and they were not paid money they were paid in kind with a little bit of food basically like serfs almost like slaves okay they belonged to the state they couldn't move around they couldn't move from their villages and by the way stalin in the middle of 1930s introduced id documents but only for people who lived in cities peasants were not given id documents because stalin didn't want them to leave the countryside okay they were to stay in the countryside and to work on the land <clears throat> he imposed killing quotas quotas production quotas on collective farms 20, about 24,000 collective farms were created all over the Soviet Union, mostly in, um, in Central Russia, Southern Russia, in Ukraine. Ukraine was uh, the breadbasket of the Soviet Union. So a lot of collective farms were created there. All private, la private plots of the peasants were confiscated by the government and turned into collective land. Okay. All stock, animal stock was confiscated from peasants and uh, these domestic animals were to become the property of these collective farms okay so peasants became workers of the state of serfs of the state um, some of the grain quotas imposed by the government were so harsh that peasants didn't have enough seed grain seed grains because you need uh, you understand that you need to save seed grains to plant them to have a good crop so that is why um seven million peasants died from hunger it was a huge it's a man-made famine from 1929 to 1933 seven million peasants died as a result of this collectivization it was uh, worse than holocaust more people died as a result of this collectivization then as a result of holocaust so everybody knows about holocaust but not many people know about so-called holodomor it's a death of peasants as a result of collectivization okay land animals machinery were given to collective farms peasants were not allowed to work on their private plots okay and which um, ultimately killed the soviet agriculture why because collective agriculture was not efficient peasants didn't work to work didn't want to work hated collective farms there was no incentive to work okay but uh, stalin did accomplish his goal he squeezed the peasants he starved them to uh, to death or those who remained uh, alive starved them into submission he squeezed enough grain to sell to the west in order to get money to fund the industrial revolution because his goal stalin's goal was to build the soviet union into the mighty industrial nation okay and he did accomplish his goal 
by the way, uh, a former Russian Empire that was controlled by now was controlled by the Bolsheviks in 1929 was received a new name. It was called the Soviet Union. Okay, I use this word Soviet Soviets. The country became known, the Bolshevik regime became known in 1929 as the Soviet Union. Why? Soviet Union, it's a kind of short abbreviation from the um, full name. The full name of this regime was the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics. Why such a long name? Because Bolsheviks expected that communist revolution after Soviet Union uh, became the mighty industrial nation, the communist revolution would roll on, would go to other places like Germany, uh, Italy, UK, France, and United States, and soon all over the world, we would have this. Uh, uh, we would have the communism all over the world. Okay, uh, Bolsheviks expected that uh, each new country that would be added to this communist union would become a republic. Hence the name Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics. So it was expected that this union would have more and more countries and eventually there would be a global union of soviet socialist republics that was the message of this regime okay again the goal of the regime was to build the soviet union into mighty industrial nation a huge industrial growth uh 400 percent that was the ratio the rate of growth okay Everything was sacrificed for the industry. In fact, in the Soviet Union and under the Soviet regime, factories, uh, factory labor, industrial labor, machinery were romanticized, idealized. Uh, poets were forced to write poems about smoking chimneys of factories. And here you can see one of the communist posters of the 1930s that says, uh, smoke from chimneys and down below it says the breath of Soviet Russia so there was some kind of romantic attitude to the smoke chimneys uh, it was the breath of Soviet Russia the breath of the new world because Bolsheviks believed that uh, these chimneys smoking chimneys they were creating this new powerful industrial world that would be able to control the entire globe for those um, for those who disagreed with the regime, Bolsheviks built so-called Gulag. Gulag, I briefly mentioned before, it was a network of concentration camps uh, built in remote areas of Siberia, beyond the Arctic Circle, to lock to lock up uh, not only alien classes, aristocrats, uh, landlords, um, merchants, and middle class people, clergy, but everybody who was speaking against the regime. A uh, network of concentration camps, labor concentration camps. It's important to mention this because people were not simply may, uh, kept there, they were forced to perform a killing labor. What to mine coal, to mine gold, silver, copper, iron ore, all kinds of minerals. Okay. And the slave labor from Gulag. Gulag, I repeat. It was um, an abbreviation. See, the Bolsheviks, uh, Russian communists, loved abbreviations. Okay, so Gulag, it's an um, expression that Soviets and now it became like a generic word. If you look in the dictionary, any dictionary, big dictionary has this expression, Gulag. It's an umbrella expression to describe a network of uh, labor concentration camps. The complete translation of this abbreviation is the chief administration of correctional labor camps okay our acronym would be gulag russian acronym so anyway gulag camps provided uh, 10 percent of gnp it was huge so economically important so gulag provided 10 percent of soviet gnp in 1930s that is why uh Planners again, Soviet economy was uh, was planned, uh, nationalized, operated according to the central plan, and each year, Soviet planners included the uh, appropriate numbers for gulag. So it was expected that 
they would provide 10% of GNP and that's how it was done. <clears throat> in order to complete uh, his dictatorship in 1930s, Stalin started great purges or great terror um, to intimidate entire society into submission. Okay, First, he decided to crack down on his former comrades who disagreed with him. Okay who either wanted NEP, new economic policy to be continued, or personally disagreed with him. Okay, He wanted to be the only one. That is why in 1936, he had uh, so-called show trials organized. Show trials to accuse his former members, who, his former comrades, members of the Bolshevik elite, in being spies, traitors, okay, all kinds of accusations. And eventually, secret police was forced to expose um, enemies of the people. Okay, so he encouraged secret police to look for the enemies of the people. And since all real enemies of the regime had been already locked in concentration camps, now uh, the goal was to find some secret uh, secret enemies. So that is why people were thrown now were thrown into uh, gulag camps for sharing jokes about the regime for using like a, a communist newspaper with a portrait of Stalin for toilet paper since there was no toilet paper in the Soviet Union anyway. And sometimes the Soviets routinely used uh, newspapers for these purposes. Okay, So if secret police noted that um, newspapers with a portrait of Stalin were used for these uh, purposes, this person could be arrested. Uh, jokes about Stalin, Okay, some anecdotes, stories, or people who had suspicion, suspicious connection with um, foreign countries, like, for instance, a person who corresponded with a foreign, uh, from a person from another country, was already treated as a potential spy. Such people were arrested and thrown into the gulag camp. So some people were simply arrested, um, taken from the street because they talked with foreigners on the street. So in the soon entire Soviet society was intimidated into submission. So everybody was afraid of each other. People were uh, scared of, to talk with foreigners on the streets. Okay, so foreigners were avoided like a, a plague. Okay, people were afraid to write letters abroad. Soviet, uh, the international borders of the Soviet Union were sealed and the Soviet Union was completely cut off from the rest of the world. Okay, the people were afraid of each other. Like uh, if three people sh uh, met each other and uh, by chance shared a joke and somehow it was a political joke, everybody was intimidated. Sometimes all three people and the next morning rushed to the secret police to report each other that they were not sh they were not to be blamed because they were the first to report this joke, political joke. So it was. Uh, uh, the paranoia, paranoia, hysteria, this um, uh, espionage mania, espionage paranoia uh, reached in Soviet Union uh, grotesque proportions. Okay, the people were arrested for no reason, and soon the gulag camps received millions of new inmates. Stalin was the dictator. Uh, in fact, in the wake of this great terror in 1930s when everybody like were people were thrown into prison for nothing stalin uh, encouraged the cult of his personality so his posters were printed in different languages so here you can see that his poster was printed in german and many languages spread all over the soviet union around the globe okay soviet artists were encouraged to to um, depict stalin as a powerful man as the communist god to be worshipped so we have this new phenomenon called the cult of personality the cult of personality that's the new phenomenon that emerged in the soviet union in the 1930s what was the life under dict dictatorship the food was russian no private property no individual freedom okay Everybody was intimidated. Everybody was afraid to speak up. Okay, Communist Party and secret police controlled the entire society, uh, police society. Okay, people routinely could be stopped on the street. 
uh, to for document check up police officers uh, frequently interrogated people asking them what are you doing at such and such place you know you're supposed to be at work if people were uh, walking the streets before like five o'clock so they easily could be uh, arrested okay they were supposed to be at work <clears throat> For some people, possibilities did expand, mostly for people who lived in cities or who were bureaucrats or members of the families of communist bureaucrats. Okay, but uh, for the most of the people, majority of the people, peasants, life was really miserable. I repeat, they were state serfs, had to live on collective farms. Women did uh, uh, became to some extent equal with men, you know, because women now were performing the same type of labor as men. They were working as truck drivers, as postal people, all kinds of jobs they they performed. Although women uh, now had to carry double burden because in the uh, Soviet society that was still patriarchal, women were expected to run the household because men were not expected to do chores. You know, it was still patriarchal society. So women had to carry a double burden. They were responsible for uh, cooking meals, taking care of the kids. And on top of this, many women worked at regular jobs at the factories or like um, uh, postal stations, uh, truck drivers or whatever, janitors, you know, or office workers, whatever jobs they did, okay. Safety net did establish, did become established. That's what uh, Soviet uh, Soviet uh, uh, regime, uh, Bolsheviks, bragged about. Formally, they declared free medical service, uh, free retirement benefits, pensions, free education. So formally, uh, it was for free, but more than 70 percent of the soviet population who lived in this country soviet union they could not take advantage of these benefits why because peasants were literally locked in the countryside how could they use these benefits if for instance many villages didn't have hospitals at all okay they could go to school because bolsheviks did set up schools and villages why because they wanted to indoctrinate people in communist propaganda but at the same time people could not could not leave their collective farms to get enrolled in the colleges in the city okay about retirement yes they had the free retirement system free pensions but again the amount of this pension was from nil to zero because peasants were not paid at all so we are talking only about city people people who live who lived in cities resided in the cities they did have they could use these benefits so there was some mobility mostly for industrial working class people and members of their families so these people can do it they could go to free hospitals they could get enrolled into colleges okay so they were the beneficiaries of this society so people who lived in cities i repeat in cities which was about 30 percent of the population so that was the life and dictatorship plus if you exclude um, if you uh, do not factor this constant fear that uh, was spread in the Soviet society when everybody was afraid of each other, you could say that, yes, these 30% of people who lived in cities, they could um, have some kind of security, at least limited. See, they, they did enjoy some security in misery. It was a miserable security, misery. Um, uh, small salaries, miserable existence, but at least they could use medical free care and uh, they could, uh, if they had skills, get enrolled in the colleges. Okay. Here you can see, by the way, one of the uh, uh, village schools set up by the communists because in each village you could uh, uh, get education up to seventh grade. Okay. As far as the further education, it was a problem, so you couldn't, there were hardly any opportunities. All right, but you could make seven grades, you could write, you could learn how to read and to write. And that was the uh, accomplishment that Bolsheviks uh, ascribed to themselves, rightly so. They at least um, uh, introduced education in the country, so elementary education, of course. The very rudimentary elementary education people 
were able to read uh, some propaganda materials, some basic, uh, uh, some newspapers, uh, simple uh, texts, and that was it. Okay, seven grades only. Some people even didn't finish seven grades because they were forced to work in collective farms. Normally, four grades, five grades of village school. Okay. So uh, the major goal of this um, village education in introduced by Bolsheviks was to indoctrinate people. They wanted people to read propaganda posters, propaganda newspapers, and that is why they wanted to um, uh, teach peasants how to read and to write. Okay, and that would be the end of the story. That was the story about uh, communist dictatorship, the first dictatorship in the wake of World War One. Okay, next time. We are going to talk about Germany, so we are going to talk about National Socialist or Nazi dictatorship, a second example of a totalitarian regime in, the, in this interwar period, 1920s, 1930s. Thank you for your attention.